pray together. God, we praise you. You are king. You have always been king. One day your kingdom will be manifest on the earth. And it will never end. We thank you that every foe will be squashed. That one day soon you will crush Satan underneath our feet. And we trust you for these things. In the meantime, uh, life is difficult, dark, challenging, challenged. There are enemies, there are foes, and yet your truth abides and will remain forever. We're so thankful to belong to you. We come now to your word and we ask for your help by the power of your spirit to understand and to heed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you're finding your seats, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to the last book of your Bible, the book of Revelation, and to chapter 15. Songs hit different at different times. No doubt when Martin Luther sang the hymn we just sung, it meant something to him. I've sung that song for most of my life. I remember singing it as a college student and wondering why so many verses seem to be about Satan. I kind of lost favor for me for a while. And then the song recovered. And if you've ever been under duress, the song hits a little different. The words have always been static, but the significance changes. If you and I were ever to face persecution, then the words let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. Those words will land different. And when we stand with Jesus in the kingdom, I believe the words, his kingdom is forever, will land different. We come this morning in Revelation chapter 15 to music, to songs. And the opera ain't over. Until the fat lady sings. Can we still say that phrase? Is that PC? Is that passe? <laughs> I grew up with that phrase. I learned this week that it was coined in 1975 by a San Antonio sports writer who was concerned at a 3-1 deficit in the playoffs. He needed to encourage the city. And he said, the opera ain't over until the fat lady sings. And that's where it started, 1975. I grew up with that phrase as a way to indicate that you haven't reached the end quite yet. There's, there's something you're expecting that, that must happen before it's all over. It might look like it's over, but if, if the critical song has not been sung by the significant soprano, it's not time to go home yet. In Revelation 15, the Apostle John records for us that the tribulation martyrs will sing two particular songs in heaven just prior to the final judgments on the earth. This is a prelude to the end. Look down in your Bibles at Revelation 15, beginning in verse 1. John records, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last because in them the wrath of God is finished. Then I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who have overcome the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the slave of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. We have here the prelude to the end. Heaven singing, tribulation martyrs joining in songs. These are the anthems that anticipate the end of the world. By way of outline this morning, we'll look at the setting for these anthems and then we'll look at the words, the songs themselves. Let's notice the setting first of all. It's in the first two verses. And we read verse 1, John says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. 
There are two features of this setting for the final anthem, and the first is the precarious precipice of final retribution. The precarious precipice of final retribution. The world is right on the edge. The world is right on the edge of ending as we know it. We read in verse 1, John the Apostle says, And I saw, this marks a new scene, and what does he see? Another sign in heaven. This is the third such sign that we've come across in John's vision. The first sign was the woman, Israel. And we saw there Israel's past, present, and future. God's purposes for Israel, his pruning of Israel, and his protection of Israel. In the second sign, we were introduced to a dragon, a a great red dragon. None other than Satan himself. He's the ruler of this world. And we were introduced to his last, most expansive, and most successful term of office. He filled the earth with maximum rebellion. And this third sign is what unfolds for us in chapter 16. Seven angels are standing with seven bowls, and these are the final installment of God's wrath poured out on the present world system. This is the third woe from Revelation 11. And this third sign is called great and marvelous. This is a phrase used of God's miraculous signs and judgments, the ones that demolished the mighty Egyptian military and economy. It's been talked about for the last 3,500 years what God did to Egypt with great and marvelous signs. These last set of judgments will overshadow those Egyptian judgments, And so these angels standing there with seven bowls of the great and marvelous works of God is ominous. What they will pour out on the earth in terms of judgment and cataclysm will be unprecedented. It will be the most awful time to be on the earth. John the Apostle introduces us to these seven angels who have seven plagues in verse 1. You remember that the judgments in the book of Revelation are telescoping sequential judgments. You have the seven seal judgments, then the seven trumpet judgments, and then you have the final seven bowl judgments. The seventh seal, when it is opened, causes the sounding of seven trumpets, each with successive judgments. And the seventh trumpet initiates the seven bowls. So this sort of telescoping approach to judgments In the tribulation period. The wrath of God is to be poured out upon the earth. Like someone taking great bowls and emptying their contents. Spilling them out onto the ground. This third woe. Which is described in chapter 11 verse 14. Will lead quickly and decisively to the installation of Jesus as king on the earth. Verse 14. Seventh trumpet. Here comes the third woe. That's seven bowls. And then the very next verse, chapter 11, verse 15, Jesus is seen as king on the earth. So what we see in these bold judgments are the last installment of judgment, and they flow out in rapid succession. In fact, in verse 1 here of chapter 15, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, John says, these are the last. This tells us that these are sequential judgments. It's not just a third way to say the other judgments. Some people take the book of Revelation as giving three different versions of the same events or maybe just general ideas of hard stuff that happens throughout history. Uh, No, these are very specifically described as the last sequential judgments on the earth. And when they start pouring out, it is an indication that time is up. Why? Verse 1, because in them, in the seven bold judgments, the wrath of God is completed. Filled up or finished. Why are they called the last? Because by them, God will complete the clearing of the earth of its unlawful inhabitants in preparation for the glorious kingdom of his son. And these are described as the wrath of God. That is the venting of his anger against the whole rebellious earth. And it will be completed in this last series of judgments. This is the last segment of the Great Tribulation. These judgments will follow one another in rapid succession. In fact, if you looked over at verse, uh, chapter 16, they just come one after the other without intervening events. 
They will be unparalleled in history for their ferocity and their universal scope. And then the end will come. And just as during the exodus from Egypt, there were plagues that led up to Israel's deliverance from Pharaoh. So these last plagues will lead to the whole world's deliverance from Satan. That is the first element of the setting of these final songs. The second element of the setting is the heavenly assembly of tribulation martyrs. We see them in verse 2. This is the heavenly assembly of tribulation martyrs. They are in heaven. They are people who were killed for following Christ during the tribulation. Look at verse 2. Then I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who have overcome the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. John the Apostle says, and I saw. This is his way of saying, I'm redirecting your attention to what God wanted me to see next. These angels have been prepared to dump bowls of wrath on the earth, but now in verse 2, our eyes are drawn to something like a sea of glass. Notice John doesn't say it, it's a, a glassy sea. It's not an ocean that's smooth as glass, like you want to go water ski on it. It's not a, a sea made of glass. He describes the whole thing as something like a sea made of glass. So it's not a sea and it's not glass. This is a comparison and it's hard for John to describe. We saw this back in chapter four, verse six in the throne room seat of God. There was something like a sea of glass, same phrase. And there it is added like crystal and all of this, like a, a pavement before the, the great throne of God in heaven. This is the crystal pavement that Moses saw in a vision of heaven in Exodus 24 and that the prophet Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. And this crystalline pavement is spread out before God's majestic throne as a, a dazzling floor. Like the sea, it is vast, spreading its immensity out from the throne. And like glass, it is smooth and tranquil and settled and solid but unlike the depiction in chapter 4, here in chapter 15, it is said to be mixed with fire. This is really interesting. In this crystalline pavement, we have the pent-up fire of God's holy judgment. It's getting ready to be unleashed on the earth. And, and the very flooring at the throne room of God is in fiery upheaval, waiting for this final judgment to be unleashed. And notice who's standing on it, verse 2. Those who have overcome. These are the tribulation martyrs. Notice they overcame the beast, they overcame his image, and they overcame the number of the beast, and they are standing on that sea of glass. Go back to chapter 12, and let's remember verse 11. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. Now, they didn't know Martin Luther's hymn, but they sang the sentiment, let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. They loved Jesus more than their very lives. Skip over to chapter 13 and verse 7. It was given to the beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That is, they were killed. They overcame the beast because of the blood of Christ. And temporarily, he overcame them through their martyrdom. They were persecuted, hunted down. They suffered. They were killed. And here in chapter 15, they are seen as victorious as overcomers. They are standing on the sea of glass. They are now at peace in the very presence of God. They are out of the clutches of the beast. They are standing on the holy firmament before the throne of God. They are standing on that pure pavement that is about to erupt in judgment. The sea of God's holy judgment is about to flood the rebellious world. And these here standing on it are the last martyrs of the tribulation. 
And the picture of the sea here is fascinating because it is reminiscent of the rescue of Israel out of Egypt. Do you remember that Israel passed through the Red Sea and then the sea itself engulfed their enemies? The horse and the rider were buried under the retribution of God before the very eyes of the Israelites while they sang the song of deliverance safely on solid dry ground. These tribulation martyrs will be vindicated when the blood flows to the height of the horse's bridles in the battle of Armageddon. For the ancient Israelites, the Red Sea was both their deliverance and their enemy's destruction. In the ancient world of Noah's day, the floodwaters were simultaneously the deliverance of Noah and seven other humans and all the animals and the destruction of a wicked world. And this glassy, fiery sea is the emblem in the end times of the deliverance of the tribulation martyrs and of the destruction of those who persecuted them. The martyrs made the martyrs' choice. Suffering and death leading to eternal life or physical life now preserved for a few moments leading to eternal destruction. And they chose Christ. And here they are seen in verse 2, holding the harps of God. This is an indication that this vision of saints is in heaven. God has given them these harps. They are made ready by God with instruments to lead this chorus in a prelude, a musical prelude to the end of the world. That's the setting. Let's move to the songs in verses 3 and 4. Notice in verse 3, they sang the song of Moses, the slave of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying. There are two songs here. There's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Let's look first at the song of Moses. Moses is here called the slave of God. You remember Moses, he was the servant of God. He was humble, the humblest man that was walking the earth at that time. And God used him to rescue the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. And there is a song of Moses. Really, there are several songs of Moses. You, you can go to the Psalms and, and read one of the Psalms that's in the book of Psalms, penned by Moses. But there are two songs in the Old Testament that are properly referred to as, as the song of Moses. And I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 15. Israel had gone through the sea on dry ground. The sea had piled up on both sides, making a corridor, and the ground was dry beneath them as they walked through. And the Egyptian army went in in hot pursuit. You remember that God caused their chariot wheels to swerve, brought them into great confusion and terror. And you can imagine the, the walls of the sea congealed on both sides and this Egyptian army driving chariots through after the Israelites and wondering, are my axles broken? What's wrong with the steering? God terrified them. They actually said, Yahweh is fighting for the Israelites. The confusion and terror led to their end. The sea fell down upon them. In fact, Look at Exodus 14, leading up to the song, and verse 30. Yahweh saved Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Then Israel saw the great hand which Yahweh had used against the Egyptians, and the people feared Yahweh, and they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. So this demonstration of Yahweh's power was the very reason God raised up Pharaoh, hardened his heart, so that he chased Israel into the wilderness, cornered them up against the sea, then split the sea, then drew the army in after them, and then buried them with the sea while Israel could watch. All so that they would believe. There are others that would notice this famous event. 
Again, this happened 3,500 years ago, and Gentiles know about it today. Certainly the Gentile nations around Israel knew about it in their day. And Israel has rehearsed this rescue for all of its history since. You're looking at Exodus 15. The Israelites are there on the shore with the corpses of Egyptian soldiers washing up. Verse 1, Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to Yahweh and said, I will sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will extol him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. The choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Yahweh, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword, my hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your grace, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted. For God's own glory... And for the rescue of his people and the display of his grace and the display of his power, God brought them through the Red Sea. This is the song of Moses. This would have been familiar to John's readers. For the numbers of Jews who will believe the gospel and then be persecuted and martyred for their faith during the Great Tribulation, this song will have significance. They will have known this history. They will have rehearsed the words of this song of Moses. And they will sing it again with new significance. They're holding harps. They're singing the song. It's a song of victory. It's a song of redemption. It's a song of liberation. But there is another song of Moses we need to look at. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. This is also called the Song of Moses, and I can't help but think this is verse 2. The difference between Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 as being the Songs of Moses is really in their setting and timing. Exodus 15 was sung on the shores while the corpses of the Egyptian army washed up. They had just been redeemed. All of Israel's future is ahead of them. All the potential to believe Yahweh, to, to walk just a couple of months into the promised land and enjoy all the blessings. And of course, you know that's not what they did. They spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness in unbelief and idolatry and rebellion and grumbling and complaining. Moses, at the end of his life, sings another song. It's captured for us in Deuteronomy 32 and 33. Look at chapter 31 and verse 29. Well, we have to go back to verse 27. He says, I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I'm still alive with you today, you've been rebellious against Yahweh. How much more than after my death? And so Moses has another song to sing. Look how he introduces it in verse 29. I know that after my death, you will act corruptly 
You will turn away from the way which I commanded you. Evil will befall you. And notice this phrase, in the last days. What's that doing here? <laughs> what, what is this great tribulation era eschatology note doing in the Song of Moses? You will do that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh. You will provoke him to anger with the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly the words of this song until they were complete. By the way, chapter 32 is the song. Chapter 33, another verse of this same song that includes blessings for each of the tribes. And then in chapter 34, Moses dies. <laughs> this is his swan song. This is it. These are his last words. And he puts it to music. And he says, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Verse 3. I proclaim the name of Yahweh. Ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his word, is, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Look down at verse 16. They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. Verse 18, you neglected the rock who begot you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Verse 21, they have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Did, did you hear your name in that verse? Gentiles provoking Jews who reject God unto jealousy. Sounds a lot like Romans 9 to 11. Verse 29, would that they were wise, would that they understood this, that they could discern their future. Verse 36, Yahweh will vindicate his people. He will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone and there is nothing remaining. Bond or free. Verse 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I wound, and I also heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. And then look at verse 42. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance on his adversaries. He will atone for his land and his people. Where does the song of Moses end? In the valley of decision, in the valley of Jezreel, at the battle of Armageddon, with God's weapons drunk with the blood of his adversaries, as he is rescuing his people, cleaning up his promised land, and fulfilling his promises to his covenant people Israel. And notice, rejoice, O nations, with his people. Gentile inclusion in the worship of Yahweh. Stunning. It's all there in the Song of Moses before they ever got into the land. These are Moses' last words. Listen to the closing refrain starting in verse 27 of chapter 33. The eternal God is a dwelling place. Wait, you mean so this, this isn't just about geography? <laughs> This is about the great refrain of the Bible. I will be their God and they will be my people and I will dwell with them. I will live with them. God himself will be the dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. He drove out the enemy from before you. He said, destroy. So Israel dwells in security. The fountain of Jacob secluded in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens drop down dew. Blessed are you, O Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by Yahweh, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty? So your enemies will cringe before you and you will tread upon their high places. Listen, the Song of Moses, verse 2, has promises of God about the future that have never yet been fulfilled. 
And the Old Testament has been waiting in anticipation. The kings of Israel failed to live up to the promise of what the king of Israel will do. The prophets of Israel hearkened back to Deuteronomy and said, you didn't listen, that's why we're in exile, that's why we're dispersed, but God's going to bring us back, only believe. And there's 400 silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then Messiah himself arrives. That brings us to the second song. The second song will be a, a new exodus. The second song is the song of the Lamb. That old song of Moses will have new significance when Israel goes back to the land, this time with new hearts forgiven as a nation for a hub of international worship of the one true God. The song of Moses will be rich. But there's another song that's sung by these martyrs. This is the song about Jesus. The first one is a song by Moses. This one is a song about Jesus. Notice in verse 3, they sang the song of Moses, the slave of God, and they sang the song of the Lamb. The song of the Lamb. The word lamb here is a diminutive form, means something like a little lamb. It's an affectionate term. It, it reflects the humility and the meekness of Christ in his sacrificial substitutionary death in the place of sinners. He was a, a beloved, precious, spotless, flawless, sinless lamb who entrusted himself to the plan of his father to be slaughtered as an innocent substitute for sinners. He is the final and ultimate fulfillment of the entirety of God's sacrificial system he is the one to whom all those other sacrifices before and after him point. Turn back to Revelation chapter 5. We're not given the contents in Revelation 15 for the Song of Moses. We had to go back to Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32 for those. Likewise, we're not given the content of the Song of the Lamb in Revelation 15. But we can go back to Revelation 5 at some of these songs that heaven has sung about Jesus. Perhaps this is what is referred to. Revelation 5, John was weeping because no one could start the end times progress of God's righteous judgment. No one could open the scroll, break its seals. One of the elders said to John in heaven, Stop crying. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the scroll and its seven seals. John reports, I saw in the middle of the throne and in the middle of the four living creatures and in the middle of the elders a lamb. There's a lion who can open the scroll. I turned and looked. And there's a lamb standing as if slain. He's bearing the marks of his sacrificial death. Seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And that one came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. Why do they sing about the worthiness of the lamb? Because you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. The martyrs will be singing the song of the lamb and it will be so fitting at that time. More songs are sung. Verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures said their amens and the elders fell down and worshiped. That scene gives us a view into the kinds of things that are sung about Jesus in heaven. 
And these tribulation martyrs will take up the song of the Lamb. Like the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb is a, a song of victory and deliverance and forgiveness of sin by the blood of the Lamb. That is, these ones overcame by his blood. Yes, they were killed by the Antichrist. But they are victorious and they are overcomers because they believed the gospel. The good news that Jesus came, when he came the first time, he came not to conquer his enemies, but to die in their place. To save all who would believe in him. By taking his enemy's sins upon himself and being punished as a substitute. These overcomers believed the gospel, and so they overcome the beast, and they show up in heaven. The song of Moses came with the cries of victory. Hey, the Egyptians are dead, but also the warnings of apostasy, unbelief, and idolatry. This song sung by these martyrs will have no strings attached. It will have no minor key. It is all victory. It is glorious. This song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is, is probably something like a mashup, um, a remix, or a medley. This morning in our uh, corporate singing, we sang, Praise to the Lord and joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Two different hymns joined together in a, in a mashup and we sang them as one song. These martyrs will be singing two songs, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, mashed up together in heaven. And the two songs are harmonious. They paint an auditory masterpiece, a, a symphony of praise to God for who he is and for what he has done. I believe the lyrics that you see there in verses 3 and 4, most of them in capital letters, those are not the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb proper. I believe those words taken from the Old Testament reflect the unifying theme of the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb that serve as a chorus. I believe these martyrs will sing the song of Moses that we just looked at, and they'll sing the songs of the Lamb that we just rehearsed. And I think this will be the, the refrain, the, the chorus at the ends of the verses. It shows us the commonality of God's attributes in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It shows us the unifying themes of the attributes of God and the activities of God on display in the Exodus rescue and in the Calvary rescue. Verses 3 and 4 serve as a unifying chorus in the medley of songs sung by the martyrs at the end of the world. And I'm convinced we'll probably sing along at some point. So here's the unifying chorus in verses 3 and 4. Again, by then singing about Jesus at the cross will have been an old song. But can you imagine the weightiness of it when you see him face to face and you sing it? Right now we sing by faith. Then we'll sing by sight. What will it be like for all the redeemed of all ages to join their voices in these two songs and this chorus? Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This unifying chorus summarizes the greatness and the rightness of God in all of his dealings. It begins with, great and marvelous are your works. Now, just like the great and marvelous we, phrase we saw back in verse 1. Big, impressive, impossible tasks. They're great and they are accomplished by unlimited power. And they are marvelous. That is, they bring about astonishment. They bring about wonder. They arouse in us the, the great big wow. Stunning. This pulls from the language of Psalm 111, 2 and 4, which was reflecting back on the Exodus rescue. Greater his works, his marvels are a memorial. For 3,500 years, World history has looked back to the Exodus 
and said, wow, that's incredible. Or, no, that didn't really happen. We can't believe such things. But it's in the historical memory of our world. What will it look like to look back on the ending of the Great Tribulation? The cleansing of the earth and the installment of Jesus as king and the once and for all time rescue of the universe from the clutches of the small g God of this world. We will probably sing it for longer than 3,500 years. Lord God, the Almighty. These are God's attributes. This is who he is. He's the Lord. That is, he's sovereign. He's God. He's the uncreated creator, the, the one who made everything and sustains everything. He is therefore the owner of everything, and he is the Almighty. Five times the word Almighty shows up in the book of Revelation. It's the only place it shows up. It, it's, the, it's the one who is powerful over all things. There's no one bigger and stronger. We're not even talking about God's omnipotence as stronger by degrees. His strength is different qualitatively. His strength is just a different kind altogether. And then the song says, righteous and true are your ways, pulling language from Psalm 145. God is right and true when he saves, when he, when he dispenses loving kindness and grace and mercy to sinners. And God is right and true when he judges. And then he is called king of the nations. This pulls from the language of Psalm twenty-two, twenty-eight: 28. The kingdom is Yahweh's and he rules over all of the nations. So verse 4 asks the rhetorical question, who will not fear you? It's a, it's a very strong way, the, the strongest way in Greek that you can give a negative. It's very emphatic. Uh, of course, everyone will fear you. It will be impossible not to. Everyone will glorify your name. And the word name here is a, a summary way to describe all of God's attributes together in one persona. God's name will be glorified by everyone. Everyone will fear him. It is inevitable. This is what all of history is inexorably crashing toward. Why is that? Uh, well, the answer comes in, in three statements giving the reasons why every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. This triad of, of statements or these four statements in verse 4. For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship, for your righteous acts have been revealed. For you alone are holy, that is sacred or set apart, fundamentally different than everything. And it's interesting, in the Bible, if you ask, what kinds of things in the Bible are sacred or set apart? Well, lots of things. Uh, the saints are holy ones. Every Christian is a set-apart one. Sanctification is the setting-apart process. There were set-apart vessels in the temple. Now, all kinds of things in the Bible are said to be holy or sacred. But what does he mean here when he says, God, you alone are holy? This is a superlative and again, a superlative of a qualitatively different kind. Do you remember in Psalm 51.4 when David is confessing his sin? And he says a really strange thing that, that we kind of argue with a little bit. He says, for you and you only have I sinned against. And if you're cataloging David's life, you're thinking, well, come on, what about Bathsheba? What about Uriah, her husband, whom he had murdered? What about Joab and, and all of the inside soldiers that had to be in on the conspiracy and cover for David's sin? What about the army that was at risk in David not doing his job and sending the people out? Now, what about the whole nation that, that looked to David's example and then had to suffer the consequences of a divided kingdom because of his sin? And then look at the whole rest of human history that looks at David, a man after God's own heart, who sinned so grievously, and that we all justify our own sin based on his example. It's hard to imagine who David didn't sin against. And he says, against you and you only have I sinned. David's not wrong this is a way to describe a superlative. Of course David sinned against Bathsheba. Of course he sinned against his other wives, which was not right to do anyway. Of course he sinned against Uriah and all of us. But in comparison, there truly is no comparison between a horizontal offense and a vertical one. It's a way to describe a superlative. Lots of things are holy and sacred. 
But this song says, you alone are holy. Qualitatively different. As different as a created thing is different from the uncreated creator. There's an infinite chasm of kind. This is a wonderful confession. Everyone will say it. There's no one like Yahweh. He is unique. He's categorically different than everything. Which is why the sinless beings in heaven cry out, you are holy, you are holy. He's different than fiery seraphim who've never sinned and never will. Qualitatively different. The second in the triad of reasons why everyone, of course, will fear you and glorify you is because all the nations will come and worship you. This is a prophetic promise. Moses already hinted at it in his song. All of the prophets affirm it. The Psalms say it. Listen to Psalm 2.8. Ask of me, the Father says to the Son, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as, you, as your possession. Psalm 24, 7, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up your ancient doors, that the King of glory will come in. He is the King of glory, the Lord of, Lord of hosts. Psalm 66, 4, all the earth will worship you and sing praises to you. Isaiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Malachi, all proclaim that all the nations will come to Zion and worship Yahweh in person. Why will he be feared? Why will he get glory? Because all the nations are going to worship him. And the last in this triad of reasons is, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Verse 4. In other words, it will be so evident to every creature that you are good, O oh God, and that everything you've ever done is actually good. We've maligned you. We've besmirched your character. We've said you're not good. We haven't believed but it will be so obvious in that day to every creature on the earth, no, actually God was right. He's good. He's been good all along. You do good. Everything about you has always been right and just and true. And so all must fear God and all must glorify him. Did you know that is your destiny? To fear Yahweh and to glorify him? And you will do so willingly by the gospel of his grace, by believing in Jesus and loving it, or you will do so by subjugation. You will be forced to bow the knee. You're on a cargo plane with the tailgate open. Have you seen those? You've seen others go out the back door into that breezy oblivion. You're waiting for your turn. A lot of people go out that back door with backpacks on, but a whole lot more go out the back door without backpacks. Those backpacks, some of them, are parachutes. You've actually been in that cargo plane your whole life, and you've been debating with your friends in that cargo plane about what kind of backpack to carry. Should you have one of those backpacks that has a parachute? Or maybe should you have the latest Kate Spade carry-all or an REI rucksack? And with your friends, you've, you've debated at length whether or not there is such a thing as gravity or such a thing as the ground. In a half minute, you'll be shoved out the back of the plane into that dizzying oblivion. And you will discover, in fact, that there is such a thing as gravity and there is such a thing as the ground. Gravity does not wait for you to decide whether it is real. End of illustration. Time is running out. Have you put on the Lord Jesus Christ in the good news of the gospel? Have you believed him in his work at the cross to forgive your sin? Or will you enter eternity still clothed in your sins of which you are guilty and meet Jesus face to face, unforgiven. 
If we summarize this chorus in verses 3 and 4, we discover that God's works are great, His works are marvelous, He is sovereign, He is the creator and sustainer, He's omnipotent, His ways are just, His ways are true, He is the rightful King, soon He will be the manifest King in person on the earth. He is worthy of all glory, He is singularly holy, He is worthy of worship, and His righteous character is seen in all that He has done. And these martyrs, singing both a victory of physical rescue and victory of spiritual rescue after being persecuted and after being killed during the Great Tribulation. What can they sing about? God's greatness and His goodness and His glory. Have you been through hard things? Do you think about how hard it was? These tribulation martyrs will have had life more difficult than anybody in human history. And what do they sing? Only God's goodness and greatness and glory. Commentator William Newell writes this, They find not a word of fault with their God. All his acts they call righteous acts. Meditate upon this, you who feel yourselves tempted and tried and suffering more than you think is right. Someday, you will declare his ways to be good and his acts to be righteous. I'm so thankful for that. Fast forward the tape, I won't be able to complain. <laughs> I will only see things the way they truly are. That's a grace all of these attributes and characteristics of God are true in his Exodus work 3,500 years ago. They are all true of his cross work 2,000 years ago. They will be true of his judgment and deliverance work in the future, whenever that is. And truly, all of these Old Testament and New Testament truths, the Song of Moses and the Song of Jesus, culminate in Jesus. Do you remember what Moses said at the end of his life in that last sermon? Another prophet's coming. Listen to him. Moses himself sent us to Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he is the lamb slain to purchase people from every nation and every tribe with his own blood. And these victors singing in Revelation 15, they will not be singing, we did it. What will they sing? Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, you are glorious all by yourself. And your wonderful and marvelous works manifest your glory. They help us to see what you're like and who you are. That no one could resist your strong arm. And I thank you that in your grace you have caused us not to resist your strong heart that we will not be under the boot of your fury who believe the gospel, but we instead are under your protective wings. We are under those everlasting arms. You will cause us to stand blameless with great joy on a crystalline pavement, solid, secure, forgiven by grace. And even before time is wrapped up, if we are in that place before you asking, how long, O Lord, until you vindicate your name, even that will be wrapped up shortly. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. In the meantime, Lord, help us to sing, and we do so by faith in anticipation of singing by sight. Amen.